Thank you, Emily, for that introduction. And a big thanks to all of you for attending this um, webinar, this session this afternoon. We know you're busy, so this is excellent. Um, it's absolutely wonderful, in fact, to connect with so many English language teachers. And it just makes me think that we are all part of such a fantastic, a really wonderful profession. And we should all be very, very proud and happy with what we do. So um, again, thank you so much for joining. My presentation today is on the power of content, preparing students for academic success. So it seems to me that a good place to start is to ask you how what success looks like or what success means for your students. So we're going to start right off with a poll that Emily's going to bring up. And um, there, I only put four categories. If you think of other things that success means, please jot them in the chat box. So Emily, are you going to put the poll in? Pass a test, pass it to everybody. Emily? Ah, there it is. Thank you. Here you go. Pass a test. OK, excellent. Well, I think um, very interesting. I'm glad to see that communicate effectively is got more votes than pass a test. But we, we you know, we have to be realistic for many students. A test is, a, a, you know, the, the enter, entrance to something in their lives that they are aspiring to. So we have to be realistic about that. I noticed that somebody said um, in the chat box, that success is a vision on how to live. Some people said it's um, 21st century skills. Anybody else want to share what they think success is besides these? Pass a test, increase confidence besides these? Is there anything else that you think it really means for your students and for, yeah, for your students? Self-confidence, yeah, I like that answer too. OK, great. Well, at National Geographic Learning, reach their goals, that's also a very good answer. Um, we spend a lot of time, you know, we think very carefully about what students want, what their goals are, what teachers want for their students when we create our language learning materials. Um, and so, you know, we have, we know that there are specific out, outcomes such as, for example, understand main ideas or give an opinion or whatever language function there is. And those are very specific goals that are part of a curriculum. But there are broader goals. And we, we like to think of, of these broader goals for learners in the 21st century. And um, I've just put some here for, to share with you. Um, we feel that the successful 21st century learner has global awareness, the ability to think critically and creatively, the ability to navigate academic content. And since this is a session for adults and young adults who are presumably have academic study in their futures, this is an important uh, skill for them. New literacies, and this is basically visual, being able to read visuals, being able to work with media and technology. And last but not least, and probably the most important, is the ability to communicate in English, whatever that means, whatever situation that is for your students. And that means to express their ideas, to share their views uh, comfortably and confidently in their second language or third language, whatever it is. So we know that those that's what we are aspiring to for the students. And we've said that powerful content can help them reach these skills or this, these success uh, criteria. 
So how do we choose the content for our language learning materials? Well, everybody, all, everyone will say yeah, the material needs to be motivating, it needs to be engaging. That's pretty standard. But we have some other criteria that we use that are very important in everything we do, and we spend a lot of time thinking about this in the publishing centers around the world. And the first one is it, the material needs to be Somebody's put their authentic or real life. Very good. That's a National Geographic learning trait. It's got to be authentic. It has to be global. Okay. And finally, it needs to be relevant. And these are, you know, just three buckets that I've chosen. There are other criteria, but these are the sort of central to everything we do. And I want to share with you what we mean by these three terms. So imagine this is um, in a, for a text, uh, a reading text that was about trying to describe happiness for low-level learners, you know, maybe A2, A1, A2 students. And the photo spec was show happiness. And my question to you is, does this do a good job of showing happiness? What do you think? Is it, does it effectively show, communicate happiness? Do you feel that this communicates the idea of happiness? Yes, yes, yeah, sure. Their smiles, they're happy. Okay, yes, <laughs> okay, great. So that's one image that we looked at, and here's the other one. Which one, in your mind, is more effective? Number one or number two? Right. And what makes you all agree? There's no, there's no doubt. Why is number two more effective? Two, 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 two. Why is more number two more effective? It's authentic. It's spontaneous. More involving. Yeah, these are excellent answers. Basically, the let me put it on this image here. It is authentic, and it draws you into the photo. You feel that you are there with these children. You kind of almost feel a physical sensation in their happiness and their joy. And we can connect to that as human beings. We connect with other people's experiences when they are real. Um, whereas in the other one, it's a posed photo. Eh, you know, they're happy, but, but I don't really connect to it that much. So this is very important for us in terms of authenticity. OK, global. In our materials, we are very, very careful and we are happy to try to represent people and places and events and customs all around the world. Global does not mean exotic or different or unusual. It means just what it means, global, representing people all over the world. So this is a good example of um, a photo from Pathways, our, um, one of our academic series that shows um, people in Hong Kong, they're connecting with their neighbors and their city while playing Pokemon Go. So, you know, lots of people in all over the world don't know that that's what people in Hong Kong might do. And on the right, you can see the world's top 10 websites and Google's at the top, but there's also Baidu and QQ, which are Chinese websites because those are the biggest websites in the world. Um, we want students to see themselves, but also to connect to all cultures of the world. And it's not about the United States. It's not about the, the UK or Australia. It's about a global connection um, for everyone. The last one is relevant. And because, again, we are, our audience here is uh, adults and young adults, this is an example of a topic that we think, hopefully, young, young people are interested in the future of jobs. And you know, what are the fastest growing jobs and where they might want to see themselves? This is one view of it. Um, you can get into online shopping. That's maybe a good area. Teaching is not up here, which is interesting. Um, but again, trying to connect students or give them topics that are relevant to where they are now and where they aspire to be. And we like very much for our materials to provide sort of aspirational content. So the authentic global relevant content is what we work with to help promote these skills 
uh, for the 21st century learner, what we define as successful, being successful. And now, you know, I'm going to walk you through some of examples of this from a couple of our uh, materials, our series, and I want you to be thinking about how the content, the power of the content, helps to promote these skills that lead to success and how you would see them being used with your students in particular. So we're going to start with real world content, photos and infographics because at National Geographic Learning, as I hope most of you know, we love photography. We absolutely love it and we have access to some of the best photographers in the world and we also like infographics. Um, so I'm going to ask you to look at, this is a photo that we've used in one of our series in Pathways again, and I want you to tell me, what does this photo, what do you feel when you see this photo? What does it make you think, and what do you think the photographer was trying to communicate with this photo? How does it make you feel cute? It's laughing. Nature, embarrassment, doubt, secrets, innocence, incertitude. Oops, I did it again. That's wonderful. I did it again. Shy. He had something he shouldn't have. Okay. He's guilty. These are great. Human-like. Burp. He could even be burping. Yes. Wonderful. Fabulous answers. Um, thank you for those. And you can see just showing you a photo like this and asking you what do you think, the, what do you feel, it opens up all this language, all these ideas, um, and that's what we want photos to do. We want them to be a springboard for discussion, for thinking, so that students um, have a connection to a visual and then they can in, you know, express themselves with the language that we are trying to teach them. Um, so, excellent answers, but what if I were to tell you that, in fact, this photo was taken by Joel Sartore, who is a National Geographic photographer, one of the best, as part of his photo arc project. And this is a project in which he is trying to photograph every species that is at risk of extinction. These are species, and many of the photographs that he's taken are actually animals or species that are extinct now. Does that change how you feel about this photo? These are, this animal is at risk of extinction. Right, how do you feel now? It makes it more precious, sad. Yeah, it's very sad. Um, but the photo arc project, the purpose, so the photographer's intent here, his goal, is to raise awareness. And that's what we, another thing that we are hoping to do is to, to in our language learning materials, definitely teaching English, but it's also nice to be thinking about, you know, raising the future leaders of the world um, and making them global citizens who are responsible. So raising awareness of some issues like that. Okay. Infographics. Let me ask you first. This is fabulous. You guys are excellent students. I wish we were could be together and we, you know, we could all be talking to each other or you could be talking backwards, but this is great because you're being very communicative in the chat box. So I thank you. Let me ask you what our infographics, um, do you see them a lot? Are they common? Are infographics common in your lives or in the lives of, well, in the 21st century? More, yes, more or less, okay. Global, yeah. Okay, yeah, they are pretty common. They are becoming more and more common. And here, I'm going to show you an example of one. Infographics are basically text and images put together, you know, charts, it can be charts or graphs, they're put together to try to convey something in a more direct, a more accessible way. And we see them in textbooks, we see them in magazines, we see them in, um, you see them on TV, you see them you know, on the internet all the time. They are very common and it's important for us 
to teach students how to read them because if the infographic is in English, they need to be able to interpret the visual and the text together to understand the message of the infographic. So this is an infographic called Hidden Water. And before I tell you what it's about, can you guess what it's about just by looking at the little, the, the images, the visual? What is this about, do you think? This infographic, what's the purpose of this infographic? Waste of water, about food, water shortage, use of water. How much water is used to produce each thing? Yes, very good. Importance of water in our lives. That's definitely a very important message of this. So once again, A+. Plus. Um, and if I draw up the text, make it a little bit bigger to read, it says the world consumes trillions of virtual gallons of water. When you serve a pound of beef, you are also serving 1,857 gallons of water. A cup of coffee, that's 37 gallons, enough water to fill the average bathtub. So that virtual or hidden water, as you said, is all the water it takes to produce these products here. And the student can easily see the little images of the banana, the coffee, the t-shirt, the jeans, and the amount, the numbers associated with it, how much it costs, how much water it takes to produce those things. Does any of that information surprise you? Or did you already know that? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty shocking. It might make you think about the next time you buy another pair of jeans that it's 2,900 gallons of water every time you put on a pair of jeans. It's a lot of water, which is why water is such a precious commodity. But what we're, our goal is with these, using these infographics is to you know, give students the skill of interpreting information that comes at them this way comes at them this way, and also developing the language, of course. Here's just one more I wanted to show you, because this is in a low level of pathways, very simple infographic, but it's extremely clear because you can see immediately that the plastic bottle here is the biggest culprit, or this is the most, it takes the longest time to to disappear. So you can see here how long until it's gone at the bottom. Paper towel, it doesn't take very long. A banana doesn't take too long. But a plastic bottle takes 450 years to disappear. So what I like about this graphic is this vertical, I'm going to use my pointer, this vertical line here, you can see the drastic increase. And this is a good tool to teach the word increase or rise or get higher. And the beauty of this kind of visual is that it overlays images and text. And it then it allows for dual coding in the brains and the minds of our learners. This dual coding means that it's easier to retrieve information like increase if they connect it with this visual representation. Um, so we're hoping that by providing this extra scaffolding of the imagery, the photos, that we are in fact helping the language learning process um, by allowing for this dual coding in the brain. Okay, do I, are you with me so far? Okay, okay, yes, yes, good. I want to be sure because I can't see you. So now, I'm going to ask, we're going to do another poll, and you've just, I've just shown you the photos and the two infographics, and I want you to think, well, Emily's going to put up this, the poll, what skills would students use to work with these, um, in this input?
Okay, I think that's pretty good. Um, it looks like thinking critically and creatively were the top uh, votes. And I agree, because a lot of what we talked about was um, opening students' minds, making students curious and interested in um, curious and asking questions and asking questions and curiosity those are the beginning points of learning because if you are curious about something you will try to learn about it and so yes I agree that thinking cre critically and creatively are it's probably the top skill global awareness I want to ask you how those of you who put global awareness why did you answer global awareness what makes you think that they are raising their global awareness. Well, critically th thinking critically leads to any kind of awareness. OK, that's a good answer, Maria. Thank you. <laughs> universal issues. Thank you, Mohammed. That's absolutely right. These are you know, the water is a universal issue. And they are, yeah, the global problems. OK. They're getting closer to, yes, very good. Now, very few of you answered navigate academic content. But I want to argue that actually a lot of academic content, if you look at a, um, at least in the United States, if you look at a biology book or a chemistry book or a history book, any, any textbook you open full of infographics and being able to make sense of that information is an important academic skill and as is communicating. Communicating is an important academic skill as well. Great. All right, let me get this arrow out of here. Put this arrow back up here. I'll redo that. Um, so now we're going to go on to, oh, well, you, we just did this. Uh, and, and I will contend that, yes, the real world photos and infographics do help students build these all these skills. We're going to move on to video. Um, and before we play the video, though, I want to, it's going to be a TED talk. And I, most of you are probably familiar with the TED organization. But for those of you who are not, TED is an organization dedicated to spreading ideas through great talks given by leaders in their field. These speakers introduce I'm sorry, the, the TED Talks introduce the viewer or the students to an idea worth spreading and help them to look at things differently. And the, we are very fortunate at National Geographic Learning to be a partner with TED Talks in um, creating lang English language learning materials. And so you will find TED Talks in some of our uh, series, as well as the TED app that me Emily mentioned. There are well over 1 billion TED Talks downloaded in non-English speaking countries annually. And that means that TED is the leading internet source of authentic content or spoken English for adult English learners. So think about how uh, we know that students like it because there's so many downloads. And we want to take the power of this TED content and exploit it for language learning materials. And today we're going to look at a TED talk. It's called Three Things I Learned While My Plane Crashed. And this is in a series called 21st Century Communication. And just like in all of our language learning materials, we don't just say listen or watch the talk or read the article. We always start with before you watch, before you read, before you listen to develop vocabulary, to activate their schema, to be sure that they're ready for the um, input that's coming. And I want us now to do this together. It says, think critically, predict. Read the title, three things I learned, and information about the TED speaker. Then answer this question. What do you think the talk will be about? So Rick Elias was born in Puerto Rico. When he came to the United States, to go to college, he didn't know very much English. How did he handle this problem? He says, I took only classes that dealt with numbers my entire first year. He was good at subjects like math and accounting, and taking these classes gave him time to improve his English. Today, Elias runs 
a successful marketing company. And at TED, he talked about an intense experience that changed his life. So what do you think his talk will be about? Let's see what you got here. The meaning of his life, Anka says, an accident. Laura says about the important things in life, near-death experience, Jose says. Um, Adriana says she's seen it many times, <laughs> OK? Uh, the purpose of life is that experience. Good. OK, but again, asking this very simple question gets students thinking and talking and um, wanting to express their ideas on what this is going to be about. I was going to tell you something, but I forgot. So, oh, I know what it is. Emily's going to play the talk. And this time, you, you know, you, we, yes, we can think about those skills that we put up in the beginning, the global awareness, the critical thinking, et cetera, et cetera. And those will be there. But I also want you to think about presentation skills. Because something important in academics and in work is being able to present an idea whether it's on a TED stage or in a meeting. So presentation is an important skill. And I want you to see, look at the speaker's presentation technique and see if you see any skills that you could you, teach your students. Emily, please play it. Thank you. So imagine a big explosion as you climb through 3,000 feet. Imagine a plane full of smoke. Imagine an engine going clack, 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 clack. Sounds scary. Well, I had a unique seat that day. I was sitting in 1D. I was the only one who could talk to the flight attendants. So I looked at them right away, and they said, no problem. We probably hit some birds. The pilot had already turned the plane around, and we weren't that far. You could see Manhattan. Two minutes later, three things happen at the same time. The pilot lines up the plane with the Hudson River. It's usually not the route. <laughs> he turns off the engines. Now imagine being on a plane with no sound. And then he says three words, as unemotional three words as I've ever heard. He says, brace for impact. I didn't have to talk to the flight attendant anymore. <laughs> I could see in her eyes. It was terror. Life was over. And I want to share with you three things I learned about myself that day. I learned that it all changes in an instant. We have this bucket list. We have these things we want to do in life. And I thought about all the people I wanted to reach out that I didn't, all the fences I wanted to mend, all the experiences I wanted to have and I never did. I no longer want to postpone anything in life. And that urgency, that purpose, has really changed my life. The second thing I learned that day, and this is as we um, clear the George Washington Bridge, which was by not a lot. <laughs> I thought about, wow, I really feel one real regret. I've lived a good life in my own humanity and mistakes. I've tried to get better at everything I've tried. But in my humanity, I also allow my ego to get in. And I regretted the time I wasted in things that did not matter with people that matter. And I thought about my relationship with my wife, with my friends, with people. And after, as I reflected on that, I decided to eliminate negative energy from my life. It's not perfect. It's a lot better. I've not had a fight with my wife in two years. It feels great. I no longer try to be right. I choose to be happy. The third thing I learned, and this is as your mental clock starts going 15, 14, 13, you can see the water coming. I'm saying, please blow up, right? I don't want this thing to break in 20 pieces like you've seen in those documentaries. And as we're coming down, I had a sense of, wow, dying is not scary. It's almost like we've been preparing for it our whole lives. But it was very sad. I didn't want to go. I love my life. And that sadness really framed in one thought, which is, I only wish for one thing. I only wish I could see my kids grow up. 
About a month later, I was in a performance by my daughter, first grader, not much artistic talent, <laughs> yet. And I'm bawling, I'm crying like a little kid. And it made all the sense in the world to me. I realized at that point, by connecting those two dots, that the only thing that matters in my life is being a great dad. Above all, above all, the only goal I have in life is to be a good dad. I was given the gift of a miracle of not dying that day. I was given another gift, which was to be able to see into the future and come back and live differently. I challenge you guys that are flying today, imagine the same thing happens on your plane, and please don't. But imagine, and how would you change? What would you get done that you're waiting to get done because you think you'll be here forever? How would you change your relationships and the negative energy in them? And more than anything, are you being the best parent you can? Thank you. Thank you. So um, I've been watching the chat at, at the same time as the video. And before we talk about those presentation skills, did you like that talk? And would your students like it? Yeah, it's great. It's excellent. Loved it. Yes, yes, yes. It's wonderful. Definitely. Excellent. Effective storytelling. Very nice. I like that comment because, in fact, he is a very good storyteller. That's part of um, his presentation technique. It's inspiring. It's wonderful. It really makes you think. For me, um, you know, are you being the best parent you can be? You could say, are you being the best friend? Are you being the best teacher? Are you being the best whatever? Fill in the blank. It's so moving. It's so um, it's so authentic. So. And I'm sorry that some of you couldn't watch it, but you can always go to TED.com and um, watch it there. Um, as, and also, we will be sending out the slides, and maybe it's embedded in there. The other, um, so now let's talk about the skills. What presentation skills did you notice? He addressed questions to the audience. This is a very effective presentation technique. It engages people immediately. Body language, right, another very important um, presentation skills, gesturing. Uh, the power of three, yes, uh, Christine. Wait, hold on. Uh, the, power of, uh, the power of three, he said there are three things, and he said he used signal words first and second and a third thing, which are, you know, we teach our learners that, and you can see real people do that as well. Humor, lots of humor, and the humor might be hard for uh, language learners to get it first, but you know they might catch some of it, and certainly in many TED talks are humorous. Natural speech. Yeah, this is great. I, I, I like I said, I wish we could be together so we could, I could see your, your faces. But um, that's those are wonderful. Um, so immediately, those are things you could teach. Now, this is how in the book we do talk about presentation skills, but these are the activities that are immediately following the TED Talk. So watch for main ideas. What are the two reasons that state the main purpose of his talk? What are the empathy? Yeah, I, I, I could probably look at this. Empathy is a good one, too. But back to this, exercise E, watch for the main ideas. What are the two reasons that state the main purpose of his talk? One and three, one, there are two of them. One and three, three and four, one and three. OK, this is in a very advanced class, Emily. OK, I can't, can't stump them at all. So yes, the first main purpose is to show that something positive can come from a bad experience. And three, to explain some important life lessons. Uh, those are the two main ideas. Here's another one. This is for watching for details. And this one, um, and I know you only watched it once, so this is a little bit more challenging. But do you, can you put these events in the correct order? So Elias's plane takes off. What happened next? A, B, C, D, or E? B. 
D is correct, yes. So after D, what happened after D? Now we're, we've got D, what's next? There's an explosion. B, you're right. The flight attendant says they hit some birds. I think that's correct, B. What happens after the flight attendants say, oh, don't worry, they, we just hit some birds? The pilot turns off the engines? I don't think so. Not, not yet. If he turns off the engines, then I, I think he can't turn the plane around. I think. Yeah, he turns the plane around. It's correct. And then next, it's, I believe it's A next. But here are the answers. I don't need to tease you anymore. A, B, E. I'm sorry, D, B, E, A, C. C, pilot turns off the engines is the last thing that he does, yeah. So you guys are very good at this. We have other activities in the, in the student materials to practice the language, to get, obviously, to get them talking because there's a tremendous amount of discussion you can have about this, this talk. You know, what would you do if you were in this situation? What would be the three things that you would, um, might learn? Or how would you be a better, uh, the best parent you could be or the best brother or son or daughter? Um, so now I want to ask you, and, and we're, we're, this can, you can just chat in the box. We're not, there's no poll here. But based on what you've just seen, the TED Talk and those two activities, and also the discussion questions, what academic skills would students use, do you think? Listening and speaking, absolutely. Reading and understanding, yeah, there's some reading. And understanding, of course, comprehension, speaking and listening. Critical thinking, yes, there's definitely critical thinking in this. L listening for gist, presentation skills, thank you. Hypotheticals, good. Explaining, prediction, negotiating, sharing ideas. These are very, very good. Here are the ones that I put. Listening comprehension, ordering information, which is an important skill, presentation skill. Possibly note taking, I see in the chat box. Vocabulary, they're always going to be learning vocabulary, and then critical thinking, inferring. And there's a ton of other things that they, they can learn. And the, the point is that with this real content, this engaging, motivating, authentic content, you can do so many things that language learning opportunities are just, they're just right there. One other thing I wanted to point out is, um, that Rick Elias, he is from where? He's from Puerto Rico, which means that he is what? Is his English perfect? Well, he's American, okay. <laughs> which means he's, a, he's not a native speaker, thank you. He's not a native speaker. And, you know, this is a very important for us in our materials when we say global we want to represent non-native speakers now he speaks very very well but the point is that not being a native speaker you can be on the TED stage that you do not need to be a native speaker to communicate effectively to to succeed in in the English speaking community and once again we hope that this is inspirational for our students so Yes, it is a U.S. territory, Horea. They speak the language, but remember, he, when he got to the U.S., he could not speak English very well, so he studied math. Okay, let's move on to reading skills. Um, and this is from Pathways. We're back in Pathways. This is from a low level of Pathways. And um, I remember that before students do this reading, they have had some pre-reading activity, some vocabulary building, and some schema activating. And we're going to listen, because you cannot read it very well, we're going to, lis we're going to listen to the first um, four paragraphs and then, uh, and then discuss some activities. In two. Is it real? Look at the two shark photos on this page. One is real, but the other is fake. Can you tell which is which? In 2016, a dramatic photo of a great white shark jumping out of the water appeared on Twitter and went viral. 
The person who posted the photo called himself Bob Burton. He said he was National Geographic's top photographer and that the picture was National Geographic's photo of the year. But none of this was true. There is no one called Bob Burton at National Geographic. There isn't even a National Geographic prize for photo of the year. And most importantly, the photo itself wasn't real. It was made on a computer by joining together several other photos. With computer technology and social media, it is much easier now to make and share fake images. So how is it possible to tell if a photo is real? First, look for a source. Where does the photo come from? Is there a photographer's name? Can you find any information about them on the Internet? Second, look for clues in the photo. Sometimes the direction of light and shadows is wrong. Is anything in the photo too big or too small? Or is anything missing? Good. Thank you, Emily. So, okay. Which one? You Now you tell us which of these two images is the real one? A or B? The real one. The real one. B, 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 A is fake. B, 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 okay. So you've all seen a lot of um, a lot of fake images. What, how do you know that A is the fake one and B is real? What makes you say that A is the fake one? You saw it in another webinar, okay. <laughs> That's one way to, to know. <laughs> the water. Yeah, the water in A, water doesn't go up like that. It can't, just doesn't do that. The splash, really, that's right, the splash. The, the cl no clouds in the first one. The sea is not so regular. Nature is not like that. The light isn't real. Very good. Okay, so you get the idea here. Um, this is a topic that is pretty important today in the 21st century, this idea of fake news or fake uh, photos and what this little reading does is it presents some clues or strategies for learners to identify what's real and what is fake. And here are some activities that basically that are, come after this little reading. So. What, which of the following would be the best alternative title for the passage? A, B, or C? B. Okay, again, remember that this is for a low level. This is for really A1, A2 level students. So you, 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 you are all doing fantastic here. No problem. Let's give you something a little bit more challenging, though. What two clues, what are two clues that can help you decide if a photo is real or fake? What are two clues that can help you decide if a photo is real or fake? And remember that this information was in the text. Shadow, yeah, the shadow, the light, the lighting, the, the size of things sometimes can tell you what is the movement, can tell you what's real or fake. And the last question, which I really like a lot, note answers to the questions below, then share your ideas with a partner. Why do you think people create fake photos or fake news stories. A prank, okay, money for attention, to impress, they want to be popular, to massage their ego. Yes, very good. And and so a very nice little activity for students though to, to be thinking about why why do people do this? And what problems, number two, what problems can fake information cause? What problems can they cause? Crimes. Scaremongering. Yeah, that's really good, Lynn. That's a very, you know, they, they can scare people. Panic, distrust, misguided voting. Yes, it, unfortunately, it happens in elections, hysteria. Yeah, so what your experience is, is that these, um, the problems that can, fake information can cause are really, they're pretty serious ones and they can be on a kind of a viral scale and influence a lot of people um, very quickly. Okay, 
So that was our reading and some activities. So which, this is actually another chance for a, uh, a poll, Emily. We're going to talk about, we're going, we're going to try to go back to the, where we started here. What 21st century skills were activated by that little reading and the questions? All right, so thank you. Um, some people are saying all of them. I think it is definitely all of them. And I, it's interesting to me that um, Navigate Academic Content gets very few votes. And it might be because the other skills are so prominent. And you know, we're also because in a webinar, it's easier to show you things that are making you think crit critically and creatively than to, you know, analyze a text that kind of, a, it's more of an individual sort of a task. It's a little bit hard to show. But I, I want to say that that, that they definitely, they are navigating academic content in that they are working with vocabulary, they are working with reading, they are working with main ideas um, and details, which are all very important reading skills. The other thing that I think is interesting is communicate in English is, doesn't get very many votes. And if you think about it, everything they're doing in these activities is in English. I mean, they, they could be thinking in their native languages, but they're reading about it. They are the inputs in English and they're being asked to produce uh, either writing or speaking in English. So I would venture to say that all of these materials are activating that communicating in English piece. It might, and, and it's just what I think. All right, there's, I think, believe there's another poll, right, for the academic skills. Yep, here comes the next one. Oh, I guess this was, well, if you think about this one, this is, um, if you think about the video, and the reading, which skills are activated here? Hey, Emily, can they vote for more than one? We have not activated that feature, but they can. I see. Oh, no wonder it is the way it is. Okay, that's interesting. All right, because I would—that's very interesting. So it, it's my my bad. I didn't realize that. And so your first instinct is to go to the one that's most prominent, and that would be critical thinking, probably, and for the video listening comprehension. Perfect. Okay. And all right, I'm going to now go to the last slide here, I think. Yeah. And I wanted to um, say that these activities and the photos, the infographic, the um, TED Talk, and um, the reading, they come from uh, two of our academic series. One is called Pathways, and the, the reading was from Pathways Reading, Writing, and Critical Thinking. And the other series, the TED Talk series, is 21st Century Communication. But the principles of how we choose our content, it's global, authentic, and relevant, and engaging, and how we hope, and we, we have a lot of confidence in the fact that that content is just a natural springboard 
for language skill development, listening, speaking, reading, writing, vocabulary, even grammar, um, and for these other essential skills of critical thinking, um, being a global citizen, and awareness of these new technology, new literacies in the 21st century. So those same principles apply to any of our language learning materials. I just happened to show you pieces from these two series. Um, I am passionate about, we are all at National Geographic Learning, we are passionate about our programs, we're passionate about English language teaching, and we are so fortunate to be working with teachers like you around the world. Um, and again, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm going to hand it back over to Emily for some last-minute um, points. All right. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, probably this was the second webinar of the day of the session, so thank you, Laura, for both of them. And thank you all for being such wonderful attendees, as Laura said, and um, you know, giving us such you know, valuable input with your comments in the chat box. It was really a pleasure to be part of this webinar with you all today. Um, great. So just a few uh, last points before you uh, send you off. We have a survey that I'll send you to at the end of this webinar. At the end of the survey, there is a link to um, access a free demo code for the Learn English with TED Talks app. Now, that's um, our new language learning app, and it's a classroom resource. It can be used with any of our core textbooks, um, or any core textbooks, all together to inspire learners to find their own voice in English. It's a supplemental resource. If you're interested in, in working more with TED Talks, you can definitely check out uh, for English language learning, and we do have several publications with TED too, so you'll be able to view those there as well. Sorry if my audio is bad here. Um, we will be sending along, like I mentioned, the certificate of attendance for this webinar, the recording, and the slides in the next bus few business days. You should get that in about five, so um, we just ask that you please be patient for that. If you don't see them after five business days, always feel free to email us at ngl.webinars at cengage.com. And we do have several more webinars coming up. You can view the whole schedule um, on our site right here, eltngl.com slash webinars. And then we also have a blog for Teachers of English. So we invite you to connect with us there as well as on our social media channels. We're on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube in several different regions as well. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. Uh, look out for those materials that will be coming to you. And we hope you all have a great rest of your evening, afternoon, morning. You know, it's all different time. It's wherever you are. All right, thanks, everyone.